Hello and welcome to this month's uh, Fidelity Digital Assets research video. My name is Jack Newrider. I'm a research analyst for Fidelity Digital Assets. I'm joined this month by Matt Hogan, also a research analyst for Fidelity Digital Assets. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Jack. Happy to be here. Let's jump right in. Uh, no shortage of things that, that we could talk about this month. And you know, just like always, you know, we have our, our regular agenda uh, of items to run through. We'll talk a little bit about the recent price action that we've seen in these markets. Uh, talk about some of the data that we're watching. Uh, of course, the, the FOMC decision today, as we're recording, this is Wednesday. So it's the morning of that decision. We kind of have some inference from the market of what we think might happen. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and how that's impacting uh, Bitcoin and crypto markets. Uh, then some lawsuits uh, from the SEC uh, for, for Binance and Coinbase. We'll talk about that. And, and then lastly, kind of round things out with making sure everybody's aware of some of the research that we've been putting out recently. So to start, uh, you know, year to date, returns for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, and, and for crypto largely, if you just looked at the year to date chart, you'd say, wow, you know, prices are up 60, 70 percent. This must be a, a really good year. Uh, but in the broader context of things, the price is up 70%, but that's coming from a bottom at the end of Q4 that was you know, Bitcoin at, at 15,000, 20,000. And so we were coming off of down 75%. If you go back up 75% from down 75%, you're still down 50% in the grand scheme of things. And so unless you were a net new investor in January of this year, you know, you're probably sitting there saying, where are we headed right now, right? We're in the middle of a, a bear market. It's still down more than 50% from all-time highs. And if we go back, you know, the, the past couple of recordings that we've been talking, the price really hasn't done all that much in the past few months. The past almost three months now, price of Bitcoin and the price of Ethereum have traded within a, a 10 to 15% price range. So very low levels of volatility. And usually those low levels of volatility you know, don't last too long. Uh, you, you tend to see sort of a, a spike in volatility, not necessarily a, a prediction there. Um, but moving forward, we'd expect, you know, maybe this range gets broken at, at some point here moving forward. And then if we zoom in to, to this current cycle and compare it to prior cycles, what we see is it's been kind of similar, right? We, we've seen historically, you have these Bitcoin halving events, the price has, has typically ran up uh, six to 12 months after those having events. And that was the case in this cycle, 2020 and 2021 were the, the bull market years. And then 2022 was the bear market drawdown uh, over that sort of 365 day period from, from November of 2021 until the bottom in November of 2022. You saw sort of this relentless drawdown in the price of Bitcoin and, and crypto assets more broadly. And that was the case in prior cycles, 2013 and 2017. These extreme drawdowns that last around a year, then you kind of bottom out in price and you have a year of chop and volatility. And we've sort of been talking about this all year long is, yeah, you've gotten a little bit of a rally, but that's what you saw in prior cycles. Chop and volatility is still sort of the baseline expectation if we look at prior cycles for context for another 200 plus days. And again, History doesn't always repeat. It's, it's not a guarantee of anything. But if we're led to believe that this cycle could be similar to prior cycles, then I think the baseline expectation should be that we kind of just continue to chop in some kind of a, a range. I don't know. What, what are you thinking, Matt? Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see how the ongoing Fed decisions actually affect this chopping, right? Especially today and especially looking at some of that recent price action. I think it'll be interesting to see how their decision to potentially pause uh, or continue to raise rates throughout the year actually affects this price action going forward. But I think as you kind of alluded to here, it is kind of interesting to look at some of those similarities between you know 2013 and 2017, uh, especially looking at those cycle tops and bottoms. And you know we often say that that history may not repeat itself, but you know it tends to rhyme a little bit. And so we kind of look at this this chart and some of this uh, you know sideways price action that we're seeing right now. And it does look uh, very familiar to, to what we've seen in the past. So, you know, if, if that, you know, past history is, is any, uh, you know, kind of, kind of rhyming similarly or, or acting 
uh, as any potential kind of signal for for what the price might do in the future. We might see something similar uh, in in these days to come. I think. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And around the whole FOMC, like, what is what does the rates market have to do with Bitcoin? I do think there's some added context there when we think of like zooming out. These prior cycles did not have as aggressive of Federal Reserve. And therefore, I think some people are saying the macro environment is kind of different this time. And that might lead to believing that this time could be different for, for one reason or another because of a more hawkish environment uh, outside of Bitcoin in, in the broader macro environment affecting traditional assets as well as crypto markets. So, so certainly something to continue monitoring. As we dive into you know, some of the, the specific on-chain data that we're watching, Matt, what are we seeing around Bitcoin addresses and activity on Bitcoin's blockchain? Yeah, so this, this month we actually saw the 30-day uh, simple moving at, at average uh, decline slightly from the 365-day for Bitcoin new addresses. And so what this essentially is telling us is that new address counts have actually been going down uh, in relation to uh, how they've been being added and going up over the last year or so. And so, you know, that's kind of a testament to overall sentiment towards towards the network and, and towards Bitcoin currently. And, and really, it's just kind of uh, alluding to the fact that there might be a little bit of stagnated interest right now. There's a little bit of, you know, sideways action, as we see in this chart, you know, throughout 2022 into 2023, especially, you know, towards the end of 2022 and into 2023, we see that that 30 day simple moving average is above that 365 day, really signaling that there was a lot of interest and there was a lot of new addresses being joined uh, to the network and a lot of new users uh, joining the network and transacting on the network. Uh, so earlier this month, the fact that it, it dips below is just kind of a sign to, you know, I think a little bit of stagnating interest uh, and, and some users kind of, um, you know, I think, you know, I guess losing a slight amount of interest in the in the space, but also, uh, you know, it could just be a testament to the fact that users are also reusing addresses. And yeah, so, 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 so we see addresses are kind of stagnating, but now what about this spike in Bitcoin transactions? Yeah. That, and so, like counter to what you would expect. If right. addresses are stagnating, you'd expect that Bitcoin transactions would be falling. Exactly. And so that's kind of an interesting dichotomy that you point out there that you would expect that as those address counts kind of decline, uh, you would kind of expect transactions to do the same. But if we look at this, you see that the transaction count, uh, 14 day simple moving average uh, eclipsed, you know, between 500 and 600 K uh, towards the end of, of the month. And so I think on May 19th, we actually reached a high of 570,000 transactions. And so kind of looking at this chart, it's really interesting to see that those transaction counts are actually rising despite those addresses declining. And so I think a lot of this can be attributed to uh, the ordinals and inscriptions on Bitcoin currently and, and the BRC uh, 20 token standard that has been uh, gaining some more traction in the space. And so it is interesting to kind of see that the transaction counts are actually on the rise, despite that that lack of uh, new address growth. So there's still users out there. Exactly. That's right. All right. So so flipping from Bitcoin to Ethereum, uh, I think we just have one one quick chart here on ETH. But I thought it was kind of interesting or, or worth talking about is this is the first time in recent days that we've seen uh, net positive issuance of the ETH token. And what I mean by that is the net issuance is you have an, an issuance to validators of new ETH, and that's a function of how many validators are on the network. And what we've seen recently is more validators entering the network, which means the issuance rate actually has risen slightly, uh, especially since April when we had the Shanghai upgrade. Now we've had more validators uh, added to the network. And that means that issuance rises a little bit. And then the other piece of that net issuance is the burn. And the burn has to do with, you know, how many people want to transact at the same time. And if there's a lot of network congestion, then the burn rises. So it costs more to transact. And a portion of that transaction fee is burned. And what we're having happen is more validators on the network, so higher issuance and a, a decrease in transaction volume on the network that's causing a reduction in the burn. And so falling burn and rising slightly issuance has led to a, a slight increase in the number of ETH tokens. And I just think it's interesting or worth watching because 
you have to remember that ETH supply is flexible. And so if there's a lot of demand on the network, then we'll see a lot of burning. And as you can see in the chart, like we've gone through the majority of the time since the merge. I think this chart goes all the way back to September 22, which is when the merge started. Um, a lot of net deflation of the ETH token. Now we're starting to see in the middle of the bear market, a reduction in interest to transact on chain, potentially. Uh, I don't know how long that lasts, but if it continues, then maybe you see you know, an unwind of some of that deflation of ETH and just kind of worth watching moving forward. And then maybe to round out on, on the data side uh, with regard to price, we're seeing the, the correlation between crypto assets and equities uh, reach a low point over the past, I think it's been a year and a half, according to, to this chart, re-entering what was sort of the normal range, which is Bitcoin correlated to the S&P between uh, 0.2 and negative 0.2. So basically like kind of choppy zero correlation uh, between Bitcoin and traditional assets like equities. That was the norm last year. Remember, you know, the, the NASDAQ, uh, the S&P had a, had a down year. And of course, Bitcoin was down, I think, 75% throughout the year. Correlations rose and everybody was talking about how Bitcoin's not an uncorrelated asset. Now correlations are starting to drop again. This is the 60 day here. Uh, but it's, you know, you could argue it's at a bad time because equities have, have been rallying and the price of Bitcoin has stagnated for the last three months. Um, I don't know what what do you make of this, Matt? Yeah, I think it's it's easy to look at that early 2022 uh, time frame and kind of see that rise in correlation there, and kind of you know assume that that kind of tells the whole story. But for the you know for the sake of of what we're looking at here, that's really kind of an outlier in this narrative, right? Really, you saw that uh, Bitcoin and ETH were rising with those equities uh during that kind of you know risk on environment and as we're kind of uh transitioning away from that a little bit you're kind of seeing some of that break a little bit more and so i think it is something that will be really interesting to keep an eye on going forward but uh you know it's also kind of important to to think that you know it was more of an outlier in that early kind of 2022 time frame when we saw that rise in correlation there uh, especially when you kind of look at the entire history here uh you know definitely uh, you know, seems like we're, we're breaking free from that correlation a little bit. And I think it'll be really interesting to monitor that going forward as well. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the jury is still out as to you know, whether long term this asset class becomes more correlated with traditional assets because traditional allocators are thinking about allocating towards it. Or if it is truly its own independent you know, financial network that has nothing to do with you know, traditional assets and therefore it will ebb and flow, of course, from a correlation perspective, but you know, can it continue to kind of act as an alternative asset? Um, I think that's sort of where we lean on the, on the research side, but again, the jury's still out there. And as we flip to you know, talking about traditional markets, today we're, we're gonna have uh, the FOMC, you know, Fed funds rate announcement. The expectation from the market is that we actually get for the first time in a long time, a pause uh, from hiking. And people are now have introduced the word skip. They're talking about the idea that the Fed pauses for a moment, uh, sees you know the lowest CPI print we've seen in, I think, over a year now. Uh, inflation headed in the right direction. Uh, and the idea would be potentially a, a brief pause this month and the market's pricing in uh, potentially a rate hike next month. Now, I don't know if you know, if you know, you're know you going to be able to pause, thread the needle, wait, and then rise or, or hike in July, we'll get another inflation print next month. If inflation continues on this path downward, which I think that's sort of the baseline expectation, you know, who knows whether or not we see uh, another rate hike. I mean, the, the, the market's pricing of forward rate hikes has tended to, you know, to be quite volatile until we get closer, like, within two weeks of that date. So, so the jury's still out there. As far as how this impacts Bitcoin, well, I think it's, it's what has been the, the core drivers of macro have been inflation and interest rates. And we saw you know, sort of a lagged increase in interest rates following the increase in inflation. 
now we're starting to see sort of maybe the opposite taking place where it's a uh, you know, an initial pause um, for for a period of time, and then the question will be, how long does does the Fed keep rates at five percent, and how low does inflation have to get? Does it have to get back to two percent? Uh, because I think most that are projecting forward inflation don't see two percent until you know next year. I don't know that the biggest question will be, you know, ultimately if rates are held higher. Are markets correctly pricing you know, that reality in? And the price of Bitcoin right now appears to be kind of, you know, if it's pricing anything from the macro side, I'd argue it's pricing higher rates, which are you know, suppressing the price of Bitcoin. Uh, but tech, you know, tech equities right now definitely are not pricing that in. And then, uh, and then when we flip to you know sort of the, the last story here to round things out, and this has been sort of the the biggest piece to what's been driving crypto over the past week, is we see the SEC you know, sort of continuing their path of regulation via enforcement. So they had two uh, two lawsuits last week filed, uh, one against Binance and another against uh, Coinbase. So both very different lawsuits. You know, kind of want to be clear on that. Um, both have elements that, that cross over you know, to, to one another, making similar allegations in, with respect to uh, offering what the SEC is alleging are unregistered securities, uh, the SEC taking issue with staking programs or programs for tokens. Um, but then where the, the cases differ is that Binance is also dealing with a, a separate set of charges and allegations uh, specifically Binance US, which you know, the SEC believes they have jurisdiction over because they believe these are unregistered securities. Uh, they're alleging that, that Binance US redir redirected and potentially commingled uh, billions in customer funds to accounts that could have been controlled by CZ, uh, who is the, the CEO of Binance and, and Binance US. Uh, so, so I'd argue, you know, a, a separate, very serious set of allegations against Binance, um, and then Coinbase, of course, dealing with what we we kind of expected would happen, which was uh, a suit from the SEC, uh, because we saw the the Wells notice earlier this year, and now this is kind of where maybe we'll start to get some answers. It's going to take a while, but one of the biggest hurdles for investment into the digital asset space has been lack of regulatory clarity. And we haven't gotten it from Congress. You know, maybe there's some things moving on that front. We've seen a couple of bills potentially proposed for digital asset regulatory clarity. Uh, but it looks like this path via the, the courts might get us some answers. But it's probably going to take you know, a, a couple of years if we're being optimistic on those timelines. But we've already started to see market response as a result of these lawsuits. I mean, Robinhood delisted. Uh, Cardano, Polygon, and Solana, what we would call altcoins, uh, the majority of their altcoins that they support on their platform, basically as a response to these lawsuits, right? And so, you know, the, the SEC clearly hasn't hasn't made uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, they, they weren't naming Bitcoin or Ethereum in these suits as, as being securities. It was you know, other tokens supported on these platforms. And now we're starting to see a market response uh, where other intermediaries are delisting these tokens and, and you know, sort of responding as a result. So we'll sort of watch on, on the regulatory front. Um, we wrote quite a bit this month in our newsletter. So uh, a number of other stories uh, that we could touch on, some other highlights you know, that, that we just wanted to, to mention. Uh, Tether announced that they plan to invest up to 15% of their profits in, into Bitcoin. Tether, of course, being the largest stable coin. Uh, Lightning Labs proposed uh, a new protocol to help BRC20 efficiency. BRC20 uh, being these uh, tokens or theoretically tokens or NFTs on Bitcoin. Um, so more development on the Bitcoin front. Uh, CFTC chair uh, said that DeFi exchanges will be regulated. Again, regulators sort of moving in on this asset class uh, and talking about you know, how, do, how do we bring these assets or these protocols into compliance? Uh, so more on that front. Uh, and then on, on Ethereum, you know, we saw Uniswap uh, announce uh, V4, which is uh, their, their next iteration that they're pushing for uh, on, on their protocol. 
and you know, sort of continued building across all of these these different protocols. But for more information on sort of any of those stories, I think we mentioned or wrote about each of them in our newsletter. Uh, that'll be that'll be coming out shortly. Uh, we have a couple of other pieces of research uh, that were just released. Uh, Max Wading Wadington, one of our research analysts, uh, wrote about the Shanghai Capella upgrade and sort of what the the impacts have been on the Ethereum network recently. Uh, Daniel Gray, one of our research analysts, updated with a, a fresh signals report talking about some of the on-chain data that we discussed here today. And I think that just about does it and rounds us out. Matt, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you have a great week. Thanks, guys.